fine, right? No? How can you even hear this? No, I thought it's not something. But I'll just use my. Just replace the batteries. No, 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 I was not even using this mic before. Okay. I thought I'll just speak oh, louder. Yes. Uh, we are recording this, so we'll upload it. Is that a problem? No, no, no. no. Yes, uh, so we receive data in uh, lot of uh, different places because map needs to be updated. Like uh, feeds, uh, our users can give us input, and what we do there is like determine the quality of those external feeds to enrich the Google Maps. So that involves a lot of machine learning and. Uh, yeah, we generally uh, build new models oh, and improve it over a period of time. And uh, so I passed out from uh, my master's here at IISC uh, last year. And uh, I've seen a big difference in the way we apply machine learning in uh, industry compared to what we do in our uh, labs here in theoretical uh, aspects. So I thought I'll just uh, share my experience about how machine learning is being applied in uh, practice. So I believe uh, uh, there was a lecture about machine learning today morning, isn't it? Uh, so many of you at least know some amount like what machine learning is. So what are all the different types of uh, like classification, regression. So you know some basic terminologies. So I'll just build up upon that and uh, give you some uh, ideas where you can apply machine learning uh, in real time software which can actually uh, be useful okay uh, so yeah over this uh, uh, entire talk uh, i'll be covering uh, about uh, how to apply machine learning in practice apart from that i'll also present a couple of case studies on how this is being done in google and finally i like keep for example for 5 to 10 minutes where you can just uh, ask me questions about the topic or in general about google or whatever it is uh, does that sound good for everyone okay so yeah but in between just keep asking questions keep it very engaging and i know it's like 5 o'clock it will be very tiring for all of you guys so i built it i made it yeah uh, easy kind of a thing okay so coming to this topic uh, why is a machine learning kind of different when you do it theoretically and in practice uh, because at company you need to make money so every software which you build uh, you need to have a monetary aspect to it plus you are also dealing with lot of data like uh, you, you are actually uh, your products actually have user base of like billions of users in the internet so if you are an internet based company or uh, anything that deals with database or something then you are actually dealing with billions and billions of uh, uh, data and uh, TVs over there and another important thing is the focus is about distributed learning so it's not just uh, you just uh, engage uh, deploy your uh, machine uh, sorry learning in just a single computer it's about uh, in a uh, you learn in a distributed fashion and there is also a real time feedback because when you deploy your machine learning models it's not like it will be used for one time so you are you deploy it into the web and then you actually see people using it uh, in different aspects and you will get to know whether it is working properly what type of mistakes you do and you continuously go back and see what's wrong how can i improve this machine learning and it's kind of a continuous uh, process which happens here and that's what I'll be focusing. Uh, so these are kind of different things which we need to look for. So what is it? Like uh, we saw today morning about introduction to machine learning. And probably there are also su uh, subsequent classes uh, like machine learning part 2, part 3, which are actually going to focus on several other aspects like uh, boosting or logistic regression, online learning or support vector machines some of them may, might be uh, like jargons for you people right now but uh, probably going forward uh, things will be covered and another thing here is what i'll be focusing today is about uh, how to actually apply the rest of the things which you learn in uh, in later classes how do you apply them to get uh, better results okay Okay, so what this ideally is like 
so we had an introduction and this is like an introduction to the introduction of machine learning so if you want to go deeper we can also have that okay okay uh, so if you ask me what do i do like when i tell okay i apply machine learning in google maps and all like what what do i really do like society actually thinks that i'm building robots and uh, my stockholders at google think we are doing some amount of black magic like my ma my manager thinks i'm doing a lot of maths and is it okay yeah. okay my product team which basically maintains a pro our google maps product feels that i'm breaking their system all the time whenever i deploy a new uh, model what i think i do is like make a lot of money for myself but what i really end up doing is doing a lot of analysis so machine applying machine learning in practice is not just about uh, doing math or getting the algorithms correct it's lot about analyzing the your results iterating over that process it's about looking into the data like looking into the input labeling it so this is what the talk will actually focus about like what do we actually do when we say we do machine learning in industry okay so is it funny like it's like uh, we have around 120 slides but most of them are like memes so it'll be probably like going over a facebook wall okay so it'll be okay so what does it mean when someone uh, says hey let's use machine learning it's not like building another software because guys who are like outside can just there are lots of seats here so please okay hey okay one does not just simply use machine learning like another regular uh, li uh, just like another library you can't just uh, plug in a new library which can just sort your data or it doesn't work that way and the reason is because machine learning is it involves lot more because i think uh, you all know machine learning is what it's just uh, it's about uh, doing induction on your data like can someone define me what machine learning here like based upon what you learned today morning so that we have some just give me some any definition like machine learning is generalization that's fine for me like what do you think about machine learning someone ha huh? yeah some way to put it yes it's okay yeah okay so these things don't look like uh, you just plug in a library and make it go working so there are a lot more to be done for the computer to tell what you want to learn and how to make it learn what you want okay so think of it as another way of programming a computer okay so what does it mean when i say programming a computer so generally when you write a uh, program what do you deal with you have a certain certain set of inputs and you have a certain set of outputs uh, like for example the sort function here so someone will define it and you will write a piece of software to implement that but writing code like this always doesn't work in but in what cases for example if the inputs are handwritten letters like this okay your input size is so large like it's almost infinite people can write their handwritten letters in any possible number of ways and writing a program like a if else condition telling hey if the line is curved like this then probably it's a letter 9 and if you start writing those big programs your software is going to blow up and you'll never end up even getting the first phase okay so in these scenarios what is the best thing so what can we even do it's about then learning from the data okay so you need to tell the computer so what you want ideally is you want to show the computer examples like hey th these are the set of uh, numbers uh, uh, and ask the computer to learn on itself to basically categorize when a new input comes when a new handwriting script comes it should automatically categorize as uh, number so what you want is rather than uh, just outputting these letters you want a model and that model should actually take these things as input and give the accurate number digits as output to it so you want to actually write so giving uh, so given this so given a data 
you want to actually have a learning algorithm which learns from that data and emits out a model and that model should be able to transform your input to output in a desired fashion. Okay, so when you actually uh, uh, think about this, this is kind of uh, what are you actually even uh, uh, doing here? You are not just transforming an input to an output like a general software uh, perspective. What you need to think beyond that, like you need to worry about your learning algorithm here. So when you think about learning algorithm, uh, what type of input do you want to give it? Because it has to learn patterns from it and what kind of model do you want out of it? So you need to think about all these things okay, before you actually end, uh, think about deploying the machine learning model. So what kind of, okay? I think you might have already seen this, so when you want to choose about a learning algorithm. Uh, you want to actually think, hey, do I have labels for my input? In that case, you will go for a supervised learning. But if you don't have, you might just go for clustering kind of an unsupervised learning. Or uh, depending upon your in output that you want, for example, if it is numbers like last time we saw, it can be a classification algorithm because you have only limited set of uh, digits. Or it can even be a regression or it depends actually. So you need to think through what your input, what your output and design a learning algorithm which can emit a model which can take those inputs and give the desired uh, labels. Okay, and uh, so actually if you see this is a whole pipeline that we are building here, okay, when we say uh, deployment of a machine learning uh, system. And one of the most important thing is uh, building the features. So does anyone know what features here is? Has it been taken? Can, can you just uh, give me an example of what a feature is when, a, when we talk about it in a machine learning scenario? Yeah. Okay. Huh. So data, when we feed data, it's not directly amenable uh, for a system to understand and interpret it and uh, for, it can't be just uh, directly used by the learning algorithm. So we need a way to have a concise representation of the data and what the feature tells is like hey it's actually a way to encode human information to the le learning system we will tell that look into this data but we want you to focus on certain parameters on which we want you to learn and that is what the features is so selection of a feature is like the most fundamental concept in machine learning and that's where like majority of our focus is like because the better the feature set you give it to the uh, learning algorithm, it can actually, uh, if it correlates very well with the end result that is the output, it can actually establish and uh, it can generalize your feature set to give better models. Okay, uh, so what is the other phase? Like, okay, you got the data, then you did uh, feature generation, uh, so you uh, you are finally into a stage where uh, we, uh, our algorithms can learn from the input data which is in the form of features and we will uh, train the model and another important thing before you deploy any of the machine learning model is to evaluate it is to find out how good it is on future samples so what uh, what is more important like let's say uh, why do you even want to build a machine learning model it's because it should be uh, able to categorize for the future set of examples okay because what you train on is on an input set which is already available to you but you will never know what is going to come up and the machine learning model should actually do very well for the future set of data so you should have some idea about given a test data which is uh, what represents what actually happens in outside real world how much accurate it is to classify okay and that is uh, another important thing okay so it actually involves uh, doing all these things okay uh, so in fact uh, today I'll uh, so in my talk I'll be actually focusing on the three things which is data collection feature generation and evaluating the model training a model uh, is involves uh, what the learning algorithm is and will be focus will be a, probably a focus of the next upcoming talks in uh, machine learning uh, part 2 and part 3 okay but I want to actually uh, uh,
tell a couple of uh, things about training a model. Uh, so essentially what it involves is like every machine learning model is like a composition of three things. One is representation, the other one is evaluation and the third thing is optimization. What does it even mean? So for example representation, like how do you even uh, represent your uh, algorithms? Like what is its hypothesis set? Is it a decision tree? Is it a, a linear classifier? Is it a, a, a K, uh, nearest algorithm? That, those are the representation. Like if you read any machine learning book, you will probably see all the algorithms are organized in this fashion. The book is organized in the way we represent these algorithms. And the second thing is uh, evaluation. How do you uh, evaluate a model? Like how do you even give what is a, how do you evaluate the model? Like what is its error uh, uh, thing which you consider? Is it like uh, uh, what type of regression error that you consider? So these are like basically uh, tells what is the cost of making the mistake, all these things. So those determine how we evaluate, like given a set of hypothesis, for example a linear, so there are like all linear functions, how do you converse by seeing on a training data is what the evaluation is and lastly it is optimization, so what model of optimization do you use, like do you use combinatorial optimi uh, optimization or continuous optimization or like there are lots of uh, like uh, expectation you might be using or maximization. So basically uh, when you uh, tell about developing an algorithm in machine learning, it is actually a combination like you pick one from the one bucket of uh, representation, you mix it with one another thing from representation, combine it with another evaluation like all the combinations will actually lead to a different algorithm like if you take support vector machine, I do not know if uh, yeah, it might be covered in the other way in other subsequent classes but basically you can always represent it as combination of one of these things. Okay, so it's actually not. It might seem like what we are doing is kind of a black magic, but it's not. Like uh, ultimately, uh, there needs to be some way of uh, association between the input data and the output. Uh, so it's like you can think of uh, machine learning as uh, like so. Consider a, a, like coding, for example, like. If you want to develop a software, you will have to write programs from scratch. Okay, and think of this like a farming, machine learning. Because here, what you are doing is, uh, you, you are actually using. Uh, what does a farmer do? He'll just use. Uh, he'll just plant seeds and put fertilizer. Beyond that, he'll use nature's skill to actually uh, get the output from it. He'll actually make use. A lot of things are actually based on nature. It has to. Uh, take care of the plant, grow it, seed it, everything. Just like that machine learning, you are actually giving it the data to learn and you will probably write a generalized algorithm, but machine learning will take it from there and actually give you a program which can actually, it will actually give you a program or a software which can actually help you classify all the examples from beyond. Okay, so going forward, we will actually focus on some specific uh, examples of uh, each of those buckets and we will uh, try to understand them in a better way. So, but each of them are a really broad topic by itself and uh, we will just try to cover the highlights of it. Okay. So, what does data look like? So, when I talk about data collection, you need some data to learn, right. So, what is it? Like for example, web page. Uh, so, or it could be uh, data could be just images or it can be videos or it can be audio or it can even be an abstract concept like system performance ok. Example telling hey this example is considered good. So any future example which resembles this input should also be classified similarly. So labels are an important way of actually communicating to the uh, computer what should be classified as good or bad in the future examples ok. So but this is very very costly like getting a label for all your input set is kind of very very costly and there are like uh, lots of ways to do that like uh, you can actually go and sit and start labeling like you can because you, we are humans right so we can actually know that for a particular input what is the exact label which it corresponds to or it can even be implicit like for example when you are uh, looking into a 
uh, YouTube, for example, you can actually get a label of whether it's a good video or a bad video depending upon the user viewing time there. So that's kind of an implicit label, okay? Or you could even crowdsource it to get the labels. But an important factor to consider here is there is because these are labeled by humans or I either are inferred in an automatic way, these can be noisy. And your system, whatever you will be developing, should be able to take this into factor and uh, use it to classify. Because a lot of times what happens is you build a machine learning model using these training examples and because their labels are noisy, so what happens is the machine learning algorithm will think that this is the correct representation and it might even learn noisy feature, uh, sorry, noisy, uh, it might give a noisy model and sometimes you, you will not be able to figure out like, hey, my, I wrote the learning algorithm carefully, like it did not have any bugs, I did feature selection properly, but when you evaluate the model, it's kind of, it's not performing as good as what you had anticipated on the future data because you, you, because the data itself was bad. What you trained on, what you told computer that this is good, this is bad was itself not correct. Okay, so that's kind of a very important thing to see. So what, what can you do when you have an IC data? So you can actually try to plot your data and into, like do some amount of visualization to see if there are any outliers. Like for example, if you see the red dot over there, that can actually mean that, hey, some of my, uh, input does look fishy, so let's not include it in our model. That way you can, or you can have some sort of an agreement like uh, these are industrial stuff we don't have to focus about. Okay, the second thing is, okay, now we have, let's assume that the cleaner data, but the question is how much do I need, how much data do I need to learn is an important question because, and what is the answer for it is, you can never have too much data, the more data you give, it's always the better. And what we find here is, in most of the cases, a, 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 or a, a, a reasonable machine learning algorithm with lots of data can always beat any smarter algorithm with which takes a modest amount of uh, input data. And this is because, uh, like, what does a machine learning do? Like, it's because it has to look into the data. The more data you give, it can better learn. So machine learning is all about data to do the heavy lifting work rather than you implementing the system. So more data actually means better. Okay, and there is the paper written about here. What it says is, if you can actually have your system with unsupervised learning without labels, that's the best you can have, but give more and more samples. If not, try to focus on giving more, focus more on getting data and remove the noises from there rather than do, uh, developing sophisticated learning algorithms which can actually work with very few samples because this is considered more effective. But more data, but, but what is the caveat here? The thing is, it's not always practical to get a uh, lot of data because one thing is, as we saw, labels are costly and the second thing is, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of computation resources, storage, etc. for if you are actually going to use millions and billions of data because with Google we have like uh, lots and lots of data uh, to classify above but the challenges we face is not about how to use it effectively to learn but instead uh, how to mitigate these challenges which come up like uh, how do you even make the computation faster and learn effectively from there. And it also impacts the turnaround time because uh, uh, you might actually be uh, uh, like uh, because your learning algorithms are actually working on like billions and billions of features and probably like a billion example. The turnaround times are usually like a couple of days and if you make a small mistake then only you will be realizing towards the end. So. So how do you even like, for example, if you want to uh, actually learn a small thing, you don't actually want to have an overkill of having a big truck kind of an analogy, that's fine. So how do you even figure out that uh, what amount of data is sufficient for me to uh, learn effectively, okay? So what we can do is, uh, let's have some representation of what the quality of the model means. So if you have that, uh, some way to represent about your quality of data, we'll focus on that when we come to evaluation, like how do we evaluate a particular model. 
but what you can do is you can actually plot a graph of the quality of the model with the amount of data you feed into the algorithm and you see that at some point your initially as and when your data size increases the quality of the model will start improving like it, it should be able to classify better on the test set and after some point the returns actually diminish that is your model will not be able to improve its accuracy beyond a point like uh, and probably in learning theory uh, you will probably be learning why this is the case but at this point you will have some amount of uh, an idea that how much data is sufficient to learn a particular model ok and uh, another question which comes up is can you even ask a particular machine learning algorithm to do what you want to do and the reason is like I am repeating this again and again is because uh, a lot of time uh, when you build a model it involves a lot of time uh, it will never work for the first time so you will have to spend a lot of time debugging it like hey why is it not able to recognize uh, what I want it to learn why is it not able to map the correct input to the output even though if my labels are correct so you will have to actually basically isolate the problem you will have to focus on some features uh, you will have to take a representation of your data and try to uh, debug using how this machine learning model is able to convert it so an important thing is to visualize your data because unless a human can interpret that and uh, your data which you are feeding you can never expect a machine learning model to actually recognize it in an automated way so you need to actually like have some notion like hey 7 when it misclassifies it as some number like 4 like was it nearest to what all types of uh, digits which are looking similar so you need to have some amount of notion of what is your input data looks like and what is its correct uh, corresponding output ok so these are some of the important things uh, when we go for a data collection now that let us assume that we have uh, data in our thing so second important thing is feature generation ok so th there is another paper uh, which is uh, this is a very good uh, paper which actually talks about uh, 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 like how to practically apply machine learning to get it working and he says in this paper that the most single most important factor in machine learning is uh, finding the best features to represent your data because that is that's the inf interface between a human and a machine learning model to learn like this is how you communicate to it ok and uh, what are the guidelines like uh, uh, like uh, what, what should be the features should be like does anyone have some idea here Can someone tell uh, what features should be selected? Like, let's say you have some uh, input. Maybe it's uh, a video. What are all the features that you can think of, and why is it so? You got it right. Like video is kind of a raw data. You can't just feed it and ask the machine to learn. So you need to identify some characteristics of the video. Like runtime of a video is one of the features. Okay, or maybe this randomly, uh, yeah give me a couple of examples of features huh? yeah correct that, that is one of the features so what exactly is features features are basically a measurement actually so it will actually help you uh, uh, as a way for you to actually uh, measure the data and feed it to the computer ok so there are lots of types of uh, features some, uh, some are like nominal ordinal uh, quantitative like these are uh, based on what type of comparisons can you make with uh, feature values for example uh, nominal like you can't of course compare them how can you even compare a feature like oranges or apples ok so these are or there might be some amount of ordering here like the quality when we talk about feature qualities like uh, how good a particular uh, place is it is a 4 star another place is 3 star so you can actually compare our two uh, values of the feature or it can even be quantitative it can be ratio interval like you need to actually when you actually uh, try to extract features from your data you need to be actually aware of these things like uh, what type of feature is it the reason why I am telling is because uh, you will actually end up in your machine learning algorithm you will actually end up doing lot of computation on those features because 
that is the representation of the data and your machine learning algorithm will take that and tries to figure out patterns in it and while doing pattern it might do like it might calculate the mean it might do a variance okay so you need to be aware of all these facts so when you feed into the fe uh, when you actually select a feature you must be not uh, for example uh, next slide will actually take about so let's say i'm going to uh, uh, classify or le let's say like i'm going to select uh, states in united uh, in us as my feature so i might just assign them a label like california will get 0 new york will get 1 texas as uh, 2 these looks good okay we we have got the feature it's all numbers so probably our machine learning algorithm can find out some pattern for state california new york and all but what happens is when you do, uh, use it in a machine learning algorithm it might actually be doing a normalization okay so what does it and going beyond it might calculate a mean on these features but what does it even mean like these were states what, what does it even mean by calculating a mean on the states so you need to be really aware of uh, because that this is kind of a big uh, mistake which we all end up doing and we won't even realize it because after this stage it's all in numbers so people try to combine it in different ways and try to interpret because and that doesn't make sense going forward okay uh, so i was talking about uh, data right so uh, we had got all these kind of data can someone tell me some of the features uh, which we can extract for these data for example web pages what can be the the host domain is kind of a feature number of web links which point to this web page is another feature okay so it actually uh, for uh, uh, this one like uh, image it can be like the number of pixels what are the pixel values for uh, uh, like an audio it can be like a fast Fourier transform of an audio or for video it can be the motion vectors or length of the video or what type of uh, viewership it has on that video so it actually it's can someone tell me about uh, system performance what can be the feature yeah uh, actually uh, what I want to say here is like unless you know don't know what you are learning it actually doesn't uh, it's actually non intuitive for you to select a feature out of a data it actually you should know what you want to learn and you should also know what type of output to expect from that only then you will actually know what type of features to use for example if I want to learn whether it is a cat or not some features might be good like for example the pixel values but for example uh, size of length and breadth of this might not be a useful feature that is also a feature but it is not so it is actually very very domain specific and it is actually very very uh, specific to the target targeting system which you are deploying your machine learning model okay so we saw like we collected the data we got features and then what are we what is it that the machine is doing then like we are telling the machine to what to learn we actually gave it a representation and all but whatever happens beyond this point like once the feature is ready and the labels are ready like there is an association between these set of features mean these labels beyond that the generalization part that is taking these examples and calculating and building a model which can actually generalize this for the future set is what the machine learning will do ok ok then again another question is ok we have the data even with 10 uh, examples you can actually create millions and millions of features ok it actually depends upon what the data is about so the question is how many features should I give ok so you can think of the rows here in this matrix as the data like for example and individual columns here actually mean the feature values for those data so for example let us say the column 2 here is um, height of a person then probably if, I, if my data has 4 people as input then these are the heights of oh that is 0 it is a bad example but just take it as uh, heights of those 4 persons ok so we have uh, like it is not easy to just tell how many features do we want to learn because it actually depends upon uh, the domain and also it depends upon how the features are uh, at how the feature values are actually uh, present because sometimes what happens is like for example documents 
let us say the features are basically uh, individual features are a boolean whether the particular word is present in the document or not ok. So, it can be a matrix of 1 comma 0, but because we have like millions of words in the dictionary it will be a million cross number of documents you are scanning. So, uh, it is a very sparse matrix ok or sometimes it can be a very dense matrix because it, we might be representing the pixels here for each of the uh, images that we want to classify in which case it is a dense matrix and in general in our uh, 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 like real time applications we generally see a mix of sparse and dense because it is dense at some localized point for some features it like almost all the example data examples which you feed in might have values for the rest it is sparse. So, it actually depends upon uh, how uh, how uh, features represent your problem ok and again there is a same factor that is uh, can I just uh, feed as many features as possible and let the machine choose what features to use and then try to correlate it with the answer because uh, again there is this trade off that you need to make because more the amount of features you will actually end up uh, uh, doing a lot of computation and your turnaround time of emitting the model or debugging are kind of high. And another thing is the predictive power of uh, predictive power decreases by what it means it is called the curse of dimensionality was it covered in the last talk no ok uh, ok. So, uh, uh, what is a good feature? Okay, if you ask a good feature is something which can actually correlate very well with the result okay, with the labels. So, if there is a feature which is like for example, if you want to uh, uh, like classify a male as good or bad, let us say there is a feature which we have which tells whether this particular user uh, sorry this particular feature is like is it from a uh, blacklisted user or a good user. Okay. Now, if there is a feature it is very very good because we know that whenever it is from a blacklisted feature sorry blacklisted user most probably it is spam always. So, that is kind of a very good feature because it relay correlates directly with the result that you want to get the labels ok. Uh, and another thing is uh, you want the features. So, let us say you have 5 features as uh, uh, the way to represent then you want those features to be like mutually independent like they need to be not dependent to each other because then it is just not they are all telling the same thing and it is not a useful thing to consider all of them for your model training ok. So, uh, like uh, we also have like in, uh, in our model training like we, uh, there are a lot of uh, theoretical work done on uh, given a set of features what are all the best set of features which represents a particular uh, model kind of things. But even before that there is this curse of dimensionality what it means is if you blindly give lot of features then the predictive power of a particular model will blindly uh, will just go down. But what it means is consider k means uh, uh, nearest neighbor problem ok not uh, let us not worry about k means does anyone uh, here can, does all of you know about the nearest neighbor classification was it covered in the last class huh? ok not k means let us uh, uh, was this nearest neighbor uh, what it means is basically if uh, let us say you have a input set ok now another huh? yeah ok. What it means is if this is the input and let us say you have a new test data which is coming it will try to figure out what is the most nearest value here ok and try to figure and give the label which is very close to it. Now, let us say that this is, this is a two dimensional grid. So, you have only two features here for example, but if you take it to a k dimensional then there are like lot of other in other dimensions also it, there may be many other uh, irrelevant features which might be very close to it. So, as and when the dimensions of the, this increases it gets more and more confused like w which one should I increase like more or less after maybe if you have more or less 100 dimensions then there might be actually 200 points which are actually closer to it and then it just becomes a case of random guessing ok. So, it is not always uh, good that you just keep increasing the number of features. So, that is where the domain expertise comes and that is where you need to pick features which are most representative and the way to do it is like you can actually do a scatter plot like 
way we do it is like uh, these are the labels for a particular feature we will do the scatter plot and we see that hey there is a clear separation for this feature it can actually clearly identify as the positive and the negative examples or we can do a histogram where telling like for a particular value like there is a clear dis a distinction between uh, a positive and a negative label okay so let's say we are classifying the spam and this is a particular feature for a particular feature like it gives a very high value if it is spam and a very low value if it is a non spam that way it can clearly identify and this is what we want to do it okay and you can so if you have a lot of features then you can even uh, go for dimensionality reduction that is if uh, that's particularly useful in case of image processing or other uh, uh, features also like for example if you want to just recognize the face it's not uh, necessary that you need to have accurate faces you, you can just go for an eigenvector representation and still preserves those uh, after eigenvector transformation you can still preserve uh, you can still identify whether it is a face or not okay you the problem is not about identifying which face is this it's just about identifying whether it is a face or not or some other object okay this is sufficient in that case so you can actually do away with a lot lesser amount of features okay and another thing is uh, there is also called something called uh, uh, a boon of non uniformity that is what i was t t telling here is like uh, when you have like millions of features for example it becomes really uh, uh, like i told you like the curse of dimension uh, dimensionality occurs and you will not be able to identify uh, our machine learning model would get confused like you are feeding it more and more information it can't clearly identify uh, it can't clearly distinguish between good and bad but what can happen uh, but what in real time happens is there is another thing called boon of non uniformity that is uh, inputs try to have some patterns in it which is like very localized and you don't end up getting like these uh, bad cases in as input okay so i'll move on to the next phase like i'll skip the training and sk training is uh, something that will be uh, taught in the next subsequent classes in fact uh, most of the machine learning algorithms which you will be seeing will be about uh, how to uh, train the model okay okay then you have uh, let's assume that you have built the model now uh, the question is uh, you are not sure whether is it a carefully engineered uh, engineered machine learning system or it's just a random guessing how do you even evaluate it okay and that is very very important because unless you evaluate you will never be able to deploy it into the real system and you will never be able to know whether it's a good or a it's able to do correct classification or not and to do it it's important to actually understand what the baseline is like for example uh, if you want to uh, classify something uh, which is random like for example digits to sorry the 110 number to a digit it can be any one of those 10 okay in that case like for example 50 50 but in case of a spam or not spam we all know that like spam is like hardly 1% of the data so even if you categorize there is a rule telling if a data comes always categorize it as uh, non spam you will still end up doing 99% time correct because the data itself has just 1% of spam okay and so you need to really understand what you want to uh, like what are you even comparing it with so you need to understand your baseline or another thing is how do you even you want to evaluate your model it can be just about the revenue of the model like you deploy this machine learning model and youtube comes and says hey our viewership like people who are viewing this system uh, who are using youtube have been actually uh, viewing a lot more because after the system has been deployed or google plus comes and tells hey number of likes we have been receiving from the users have gone really higher because of the training or google adwords tells uh, revenue of google advertisements have increased so these are kind of a direct uh, ways to evaluate but these are not easy to do it because there is no direct correlation between what your system was targeting what your model output was and what this is then this is what a program manager will come and say to you but you can't improve your uh, algorithm based on this so what we can do is to actually develop the metrics like these are uh, kind of a pseudo uh, evaluators for your model okay so you can actually have some sort of notion of what a true positive like for example if actual label is correct and your model also evaluates as correct you can actually tell it is true positive or you can identify regions where under what inputs does true label was tr uh, good 
uh, is like yes, but my model actually told no. So what are all those inputs? So those are called false negatives. So you can identify those things. Like if you are if you are actually uh, want to ca catch and improve your algorithm on that, you need to actually bucketize into false negative, or false positives, and actually try to figure out okay why was this classified wrong? What can what sort of new feature should I introduce to get it classified correctly? Okay. So for example, clustering it can be like what are the distances between these two clusters or you can even visualize it or there are lots of other metrics like what is the accuracy of my model what is the precision recall by what these terms mean is like uh, like precision tells you how good it is to classify between a good and bad data recall tells what its coverage is like given uh, like if you are mo if you are training with a model which has 90% of good label and how much are you able to identify something as good? Like, is it like 80 percent you can still identify it as good? Is what recall uh, tells. Okay, but these are actually proxies. So uh, I think these are some of the things which might already be covered, isn't it? How to test a model. So I'll just uh, skip over. So this is called uh, cross validation. Okay, another important problem in machine learning and that's what I deal with on a daily basis whenever I train models for in my work is about overfitting. What does it even mean by overfitting? Like, so let's say, uh, uh, I'll give you two models. One is you actually train on input data and uh, but what you are, what are you, what do you want it to work on? It's, it should work on the future data. So let's say I train on a model, and it, I later on tell that, hey, my algorithm is 75% accurate on the training label, and maybe 25% accurate on a test label, or something with another model which says I'm 50% accurate on a training model, but 50% on test also. Then which one would you prefer, a former or a later model? Later, right? Because you want it to perform good on a test data not on the training data and this can happen very often because what happens is sometimes we might leak the answers through the features which we are feeding okay and that might only be happening only in the test training data so what machine learning model will think is hey this feature looks really good like it's very very correlating with the final answer whether it is a good or bad so let's say that uh, this feature should be given a very high weight but it turns out that this feature is not that good in actually for the future data in that case we, you actually end up uh, with a very weak model so that's what so if you actually uh, see here like more and more data you feed like it might do very well on training because it learns more and more patterns out of the training set so of course it will do very well on a training set but it might you might see that for a future or a, for a test data it might actually be giving a diminishing returns in fact it is doing negative because it has tried to overfit on the training data it has observed things which are not uh, reflective of the future uh, data so what you can think of is for example let's say i have uh, 10 features and for and i have uh, 10 examples also okay so for those 10 examples let's say i am training the model what it can easily do is let's say uh, for these features let's say the conjunction of these exa 10 examples uh, it should always be true for example it, it's a boolean whether it's uh, true or false okay so for those 10 examples because it's a or of uh, the labels of each of those it will always do right on the training sample like it's 100 percent accurate but when a new example comes in which is not the R of the input set, it will of course do very bad. And that's what overfitting is. So you need to be very, very careful. Like for example here, the problem was to classify whether there is a tank or no tank in World War II when it was used. But what did it even, uh, but it did not, it, it, it actually classified initially, but later on it failed when we deployed it in a new scenario because it actually did not classify to learn what is, whether the image has a tank or not. Instead, it was actually learning whether there was cloud or not. But because in the war scenario, there was already a big cloud, so it used to classify it correctly. So it's kind of, so you need to be very careful. And there are lots of techniques, I think the subsequent classes will be talking about, about how to uh, reduce overfitting uh, scenarios. And generally we use kind of a regularizing or we try to actually get simpler models so that, which is kind of 
generalized models which can work for future data okay and the last thing which i want to highlight is experimentation okay so we have built the model we have evaluated it but that's not the end of the world like there is much more so the reason is machine learning uh, is kind of a iterative process you will never get it right in the first place okay so you do data collection you do feature extraction train the model evaluate it find out that it does not do anything good at all in fact it does worse than the baseline okay then what do you do you will rethink about hey maybe my data is not correct or maybe the way i am representing the features that is i'm not actually picking up i'm not allowing the machine learning model to learn effectively then probably you will go and tweak the features or you know, most probably like the 90% of the work which you do as a machine learning expert it falls in these three buckets okay or you might get a better evaluation metrics to see whether uh, okay so training a model or improving the learning algorithm is like a 10% work and most of them is like a kind of established work so you'll just be using it as a library so this is how it like you have a 70% result then you feel that your feature is not good enough you come up with a new feature you improve the result and this is kind of an uh, iterative process and very closely like we do parameter tuning like machine learning is what like the model actually consists of set of parameters on which it can uh, get the input classified as output so the par parameters need to be tuned and that need can be done in a variety of ways and uh, like i just give an example like don't worry like there are lots of terms which you might not even recognize here but i'm sure like i can't even explain some of these things right now because each of them might need you to take a formal machine learning course to understand but just have it in mind that machine learning involves much more than just writing smart algorithms to emit models or we use svm we don't use anything more sophisticated than that but it's about the focus is about developing algorithms which can actually take which can work on millions and billions of features and examples like we actually take svm and make it work on a distributed manner okay but if you see a research paper on svm all it tells is uh all the it actually assumes that all your training data is on single memory model like it's on a ram and it can learn whatever it wants but that does not apply when you have a distributed system where each system can only see one set of examples not the whole training set okay that's where most of our focus uh, are correct but uh, are sh there should be some tools right say if you that where you can specify whether uh, the type of representation you need or the optimization you need say you give the specification yes yes and then there should be some tool will which there, there are definitely in fact there are like lot of teams which only develop uh, machine learning algorithms and make it a library but most of like other teams like us for example google maps or gmail they could just call that library but all that is like it's just a simple library but whole other grunt work which i was talking about collecting the data representing the feature evaluating or something that each domain expert can only do it okay and that's what we do it but th for coming to your question i can't answer it like what exact the, those tools are because those are like patented and proprietary and in fact i wanted to actually present some of those things as a part of this talk because that is kind of more mathematical and uh, more interesting uh, or, or whatever uh, but i was not i was advised not to talk about all those because those are proprietary things okay so instead i'm like talking about general things here thanks any one tool which is like good and we can use it for learning purpose oh uh, yeah there are definitely like if you just use uh, a matlab it has almost uh, libraries for almost all the uh, 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 machine learning algorithms which we will be covering for this entire summer school okay in fact there will be some hands on session where you will actually be using some of these libraries on test date uh, sorry on some few samples and build models okay and uh, the algorithms which we have discussed now like the decision tree or came so what according to you is more efficient have you uh, means it depend on the uh, application where we applied or is there any algorithm which is efficient than the other algorithms uh, no as i told you right so these are very very domain specific okay uh, and it depends upon how much 
of input you want it actually depends upon what type of problem are you trying to classify here so, okay so decision tree is a whole different thing than a logistic classifier okay though both of them are ultimately doing classification so some of it has a high bias some of it has a high variance okay i'm just throwing out terminologies here don't worry you you will learn because some of them might need overfitting some of them will not so it actually depends upon the scenario it's not like a one rule if you have that one rule then i don't have any job at google okay because people will use that rule okay so it actually depends upon the data yeah you can also ask general questions about google or anything that okay we have do we have some additional time okay okay, okay. yeah uh -huh. uh okay uh so like i told you at the starting what i do is to classify so uh, i actually build machine learning models which can classify external feeds which come to google maps whether it is good or bad so let's say uh you have a business listing okay what i mean by business listing is like uh, a mcdonalds restaurant in uh, in new bl road in bangalore okay nearby now over a period of time its phone number might change or it might just close down or a new uh, next to it some uh, uh, dominoes might come up okay so to keep the maps updated we need external data to flow in and update those maps okay it can come from the users like in maps you can just directly go and tell hey th there is a new thing coming up or we take it from a bunch of different things like yellow pages all these things okay so when they come not all of them will be good some of them might even be spam some of them might be fake or all these things can happen so what we do is to build a machine learning model which can actually just the quality of the edit okay so we call this as an edit which changes the data to just that edit and should we apply it to the maps or not because maps quality is something that we care the most okay that's why and uh, there also like uh, uh, like what is our input data it's basically the feeds which we get it okay what are all the features is uh, can you name a few features out of it like what can help us to determine whether a particular change is good or bad ha ah, credibility of the source is another feature exactly yeah but it depends much more than that right like it also depends upon uh, uh, like uh, what is the business listing about itself like is it a restaurant or is it some theater or is it some something else like or it might just be a park if someone is giving a phone number to a park it's totally ridiculous right like how many parks have a phone number it actually depends upon lot of other things okay that becomes another feature so we identify features so we train the model like i use uh, logistic uh, regression for my uh, learning and yeah and we have a lot of other interesting ways to evaluate our model also ha huh. it's not about hectic it's definitely hectic but this is what i love to do so i don't feel it that way yeah in fact there are lots of uh, good challenges and yeah i feel uh, it's kind of overwhelming to work at google Oh, the these are some of the things that which you experiment. Okay. But then, how would I? Uh, I have a uh, trade-off between two algorithms. No, you can actually use a uh, like you can get both of them and calculate the mean of those results and give it. Okay. okay. It might depend upon different scenarios, or you might be having like an if condition telling, hey, if the data comes from this source, probably SVM might make a more sense. But if it comes from a different different source, like for example, for a from an external yellow page feed, I might use SVM. But for a user input feed through maps, I might use a logistic classifier. So it actually depends upon the scenario, and there are lots of interesting ways to do this also. Like, uh, and basically these are just libraries, and you need to work through your, you need to try experiment. So I was telling about the experimentation stuff, right? Like you improve the features or you deploy a new learning algorithm. That's where you fit this into. Okay.
can you use the mic my training model has come from crowdsourcing so for a statistical model ha huh. uh, so uh, i can only get the confusion matrix and from that i can say recall or precision but how do you exactly get the faulty data points so that i can actually re-verify them or prune them based on them that needs you to somehow visualize the data like i was talking about right so visualization of the data is a critical thing in debugging a machine learning model okay so actually what you have to do essentially here is to plot your set of examples and come up with a metric which can actually tell you whether a particular point is an outlier or not yeah. okay these are again domains very very domain specific like what is outlier to you I, i i can't just tell you right like unless i see the data i can't tell you whether uh, it's an outlier or not because for something that might not be an outlier for some learning case so what are you even targeting for like we are targeting on speech speech neural network okay speech. Huh. so unit concatenative synthesis so, so we are uh, based based on phonemes and syllables we are categorizing them differently and uh, doing them okay. but the labeling is done by crowdsourcing so we can't exactly okay if the labels are noisy then uh, probably what you can uh, do is kind of a pre clustering you can do on that like and assign the majority label which falls into that cluster okay like you can cluster the input regardless of the labels and then assign them like it actually i don't know i'm not that uh, speech uh, recognition expert so uh, what i what are you telling about pre clustering no there are uh, that is one way what i am telling is even before you feed that model you want to get a perfect noiseless data right so there might be some things like domain specific ways to do that but in general like people do some, some sort of pre clustering that is cluster your data into some point like you have those buckets then and then you take the majority of the labels which are in that cluster for example if 99% of all the data in your cluster has true as a label that is for example spam and you take even that 1% also label it as spam okay that's kind of pre labeling which you do So uh, let's thank uh, Narayan for this talk. Uh, I request Satya to give the momentum.